Hello and welcome to this week's very special Dividend Cafe podcast and video. You can see I'm kind of sitting in a slightly different place here in the studio, and I'm actually not going to go through and do the normal Dividend Cafe podcast content that talks about the topic from the Dividend Cafe. This way, you you and we are getting the best of both worlds because I'm going to really force you to go to DividendCafe.com to read the weekly commentary because it isn't... Uh, on the same subject that we're about to talk about here in the studio. Um, uh, We are going to use this Dividend Cafe podcast and video to have the investment committee come to you and kind of talk about a whole lot of different topics. We have Brian and Dea and myself all in the same room here together. We haven't done this in a little while, and we just got sort of uh, pumped up to do this today. But there is a special Dividend Cafe uh, written commentary on the subject of structured credit, except for it isn't really about structured credit. Um, Fundamentally, what I tried to do in the written commentary this week is really provide in a way I haven't before, uh, a deeper explanation as to why exactly the Bonson Group last year in our Operation Magnify uh, separated out credit instruments from boring bonds. How we can take two things that are, for so much of the world, considered to be part of the same asset class and totally and completely make them distinct from one another. Um, I believe we're doing it right. Everyone else is doing it wrong. And I make that case in Dividend Cafe today. And then unpack a little deeper some of the kind of more fun stuff that exists in the credit asset class, more opportunistic, kind of juicy returns, high yield, all the stuff everybody loves. And we unpack the risk and reward of structured credit. So um, you got to go to DividendCafe.com for that stuff. But now I want to bring in my partners uh, and, and fellow members of our investment committee, uh, Dea Pranas and Brian Seitel, who you know. Good morning. Uh, hey Bri- there. Good morning. Yeah. So, we're, so but look, I, we're kind of got different camera arrangement, microphone setup and everything here than we're used to. But um, I don't know. It feels to me like we're just back at home. Yeah. This is- this is comfortable. This How is we great. Roll. It's good to be oh, yeah. here. It's been a while. Why has it been so long? A couple of months. Kind of yeah. busy. Yeah, yeah. I guess a couple so. of things have gone on, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. For 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 you guys listening at home, the the three of us uh, converse quite frequently, um, and by frequently I mean between um, <laughs> our our ongoing written chatter and our uh, verbal chatter. It, it, it's throughout the day, all day, every day, and of course, when it comes to like security selection or core dividend portfolio, those things. Are things you may know about. We write every Wednesday in the weekly portfolio holdings report why we're buying this stock, selling this stock. But of course, what feeds into all of those things are the macro viewpoint we have on markets at large, on the economy, different asset classes. And both Dan and Brian have joined me in New York City for years for our annual trip where we go and meet with all of our asset managers. I believe the first time Brian came with me was 2014. That sounds right. Yeah. And and then Dea joined in 2015. So we've done this together for many years. We have another trip coming up here in about six, five or six weeks, and another 20 plus you know meetings scheduled. Um, but but right now I want to just sort of talk generally about one of the things I think that the the listeners care about most. I'll start with you, Dea. What do we think about this market? So really, uh, the the question I get from clients uh, and listeners and any, anybody that really follows markets is, are valuations too stretched? Uh, we're at all time highs. Uh, is, has, has the has the index ran up too much? And uh, should as you're talking, both S and P and Dow at least intraday are at all time highs right now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So so uh, are the are the indices a little stretched? Uh, and the answer to that, and we were just talking about this uh, uh, before we started the podcast. Is really uh, is let's look at valuations and let's look at where they are historically, and is that exercise even relevant? Uh, and if you look at the forward PE currently, it's at a, a little over 21, a little over 21. The 25 year average is a little, a little over 16, so it's a, it's a little above a standard deviation away from from its average. That being said, you have to take into account how low. Let me ask you a question. Why, when you say one standard deviation above, when I hear 21 and 16. Mm. I hear five, and five divided by sixteen. You're talking about thirty percent higher. Yes, exactly. Yes, isn't that kind of the way like a, a investor might think about it? Uh, well, the the idea is is the uh, is the is the current valuation that far away from what we've seen normally? Okay. And if if it's a little over standard deviation, I mean, the answer is yes and no. But the, the, there are other factors you have to take into consideration. Namely, where where rates are. Obviously, rates affect valuations, and rates are extraordinarily low 
uh, you know, relative to, 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 to the long-term average. So rates are a little over percent right now. So evaluations don't seem that stretched to me um, when you take all those factors in consideration. I know, I know uh, there's a lot to put in perspective here. And I know Brian, uh, you know, had a lot to share about this. And I'm interested in his thoughts, uh, yeah. you know, regarding some of these valuations. And, but there's a lot to unpack here. No, I, I, yeah, those are the numbers. You know, average of 16 and current around 22. Take current S and P of 4450 divided by around a 200 earnings per share of 2021. You get to that 22 level. Even um, going, even you, 12 months out though, I think you're only now because the the growth expectations for 22 have come way down. I've been talking about this because we got so much of that growth in 21. Yeah. Mm. So I think even then you're not much more than 210 forward. So 4450 divided by 210, you're still you're still 21. Close. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but but you know when you talk about standard deviation, usually it's it's sort of a, a trend line that people are looking at of interest rates and the markets, and then they're kind of judge how many standard deviations above that above the trend line on S and P. And so we'd be a couple two and a half times above trend line on standard deviation. The the one thing I would mention though in, in those calculations is that there is a certain risk free rate you have to sort of assume in those calculations, which is the the yield interest rates on on say a ten year treasury. When you look at yields now versus their trend line over historical periods and you try to juxtapose, juxtapose those together, then you get to a more kind of fair value actually in markets. You know, so it's I would say this when I look at market valuation, generally, I'd say it's more fairly valued to slightly overvalued. But I would say that there's a bifurcation of which parts and components of the market we're talking about. If you look at the S&P 500, we can look at certain technology sectors and certain things that were really frothy in 2020 into 20, 2021 versus some of the other sectors that are now kind of recovering. And it's sort of this rotation that we've talked about, I think, even on the last podcast that we did. Um, so valuations, in my book, when you factor in interest rates, are a little bit more fairly valued than screamingly overvalued. But they're they're certainly on the high end, no I, question. I, I completely agree. And, and uh, as far as the, if you look at the spread between the valuation on the 80th percentile stock in the S&P versus the 20th percentile, that spread is very, very large, uh, relatively speaking. So, like Brian was saying, that it, you know, even if you may think that that 22 is high, there's a lot of a potential opportunity on the low end of those valuations. Yeah, but that that, that bifurcation that you're talking about only matters if one is active. It exactly. doesn't matter exactly. if you're indexed. Well, I, I, we happen to be active. Well, we, do. we do. And so I think that this makes that point as to one of the thesis behind active management and value selectivity is that there is that bifurcation. Uh, the last point, that 80th percentile point you make, the last time at which it was this severe really was 1999. Mm -hmm. And so, so – it is a lot more helpful. The way you guys are both framing it is a lot more helpful in talking about the expensiveness of the market, to talk about the expense, the extreme expensiveness of some parts of the market and, and mostly normal valuations of a lot of other parts when adjusted for the discount rate, right. when adjusted for the reality of a zero rate environment. I think it does do two things, though. Uh, it, it's true you can say adjusted for the risk-free that the valuations become a little bit more palatable. But it does intensify the risk around that risk-free rate. It does intensify the totally. risk around. Totally. Uh, it makes the <laughs> markets uh, much more dependent upon the loving hand of the Federal Reserve. One hundred percent, and and that's the that's where it's we de are. It's destabilizing, For and and it is. Uh, uh, it, it makes us fragile. It does, and and it's not a place I would I wish we I would mm -hmm. want to be here, but it's just sort of where we are. And you're seeing that with the Federal Reserve and the things that they've done coming through the pandemic and all of the extraordinary measures that they took to buy actual risk assets through SPVs and things that they hadn't done before. And so now we have this. And it's not just in the U.S. This is a global phenomenon, but mm -hmm. um, you know this is the the world that we live in. Yep, absolutely. The, the, the rate markets are ab uh, definitely distorted through intense manipulation by central banks. And um, maybe it's a good time to talk about the other asset classes. And, um, you know, obviously, it's, we're, we live in a bit of a Tino world, but maybe there are other opportunities out there. Well, there. Let, actually, let's let's wrap a bow, put a bow around about the U.S. equity valuations. OK. Um, and then definitely move into those other asset classes that you mentioned. <clears throat> we've kind of all shared our conclusions about what the, the earnings valuations seem to indicate. But I wonder if you guys have any thoughts on other valuation metrics besides PE. Uh, does the the market capitalization to mm -hmm. GDP concern you? Does the price to book or price to revenue concern you? Because those tend to be even more stretched than PE. They do. And the market cap to GDP one is ex extraordinarily <laughs> stretched. So this is sort of the old school Buffett indicator that he used forever mm -hmm. and ever. 
Um, I, that doesn't overly concern me um, because I think that just like interest rates have changed the paradigm of where PEs are historical standards, I also think that the fact that the GDP of this country is measuring the output of the U.S. and the market cap of companies in the U.S. is measuring the market cap of those companies earning 60% right. of the revenues from planet Earth outside of the U.S. And so I just think those that that ratio has been a little skewed over the past 20 years. I, um, I completely, it's totally, I, it's completely I don't think unreliable. Buffett has mentioned this indicator forever. It's, no, it's, it's totally it's, unreliable. It's, it's 40 it, years old. It's been called a Buffett indicator from something he mentioned like in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it worked back. It, it did yeah. work for a long time, but that, that has decoupled in my opinion. But, yeah. Yeah, I agree. A- anytime somebody says this is what Buffett did or takes a sniff from Buffett, I, I I start to I stop paying attention because it's almost always <laughs> manipulated. Uh, well, to and it's, so their own it's, it's so it's selective. It's so selective. And it's they not say, helpful. And, and they obviously are saying it as if it is supposed to be authoritative, and and yet then they won't on other times. So when the media wants to portray a negative connotation, they'll talk about something Buffett's selling. But then when the when you're going through yes. a real bad time and they want a negative narrative, they don't mention like, oh, I don't know, he still owns all these things. Let's look at what he's not selling today. Right. Yes. You know, I mean, the whole thing is so stupid. Yeah, it's but, so biased. And but but from a yeah. valuation standpoint, though, I do think when you take the aggregate of all of them, okay, price book, price sales, price earnings, I agree. I think there's holes in the in the market cap divided by GDP. I don't see how anyone could deny that on a relative basis, things are pricey. Totally. It's, are. it's extreme priciness is the question. Because pricey has never helped us on timing. It's never helped anyone on timing. But I think from an extreme pricey standpoint, I would stand behind the belief that we have articulated in the past that those very frothy, that are more speculative-oriented asset classes, we won't mention any particular names. And it's not even really just FANG we're talking about right now. It's it's even like riskier than FANG tech stuff. Yeah, I think that is the stuff that just the risk-reward ratio is t- unfavorable. It, it absolutely is. And it doesn't mean that those companies won't be around. And it doesn't mean that eventually they won't grow into that. It just means that when you look at that stuff in the 1990 era, whatever name you want to pick, those mega cap technical companies, they didn't, you know, the forward returns were zero for 20 years. Um, and so that's where you're going to find yourself. Um, you know, and, and but there's plenty of parts of the market. So when I talk about valuation, there's pl- plenty of parts of the market, individual securities and individual names that we own that I feel great about mm-hmm. and I think are not overly valued. In fact, they're below average of the S&P and offer a lot of ton uh, of uh, forward-looking returns. So it's not all overvalued. What, uh, obviously, uh, you guys speak to clients all day long. How do you get them to understand the difference between uh, – what a great stock. Uh, so a lot of these companies that are very frothy in the S&P are great companies, that, but they're not great investments. Yeah. And those two things are, are different. How do you? I think we do it by that, what you just said. Valuation okay, okay. matters. Okay. Yes. You know, they're right. great companies. And at some point, maybe we'll own them uh, when valuation is attractive. And now they, they aren't. Yeah. But I think that that distinction between a company and a stock, it's easier to um, help people understand the distinction when you're doing it all the time. So like like right now we're talking about a negative that, oh, we may like the company that is, let's say, the largest e-commerce company, but we don't like the stock because of valuation and so forth. That's a negative application of this principle. But I try to do the same thing on the positive side. We may like the company that we own that makes uh, um, diapers and household detergent and is one of the largest consumer product companies in the world, but I don't refer to it as liking the stock of this product particular company it's this it's the business business. that we like it's the operating (laughs) enterprise and and that that cuts both ways there's two sides to that coin yeah i have more cliches (laughs) just keep them rolling um so day other asset classes um we look at the equity side we of course have our convictions where we think valuations are reasonable where we're invested dividend growth u.s equity but then now We want to package uh, other asset classes to make a holistic portfolio, provide appropriate diversification for a client. Um, Valuation story is never about the S&P 500. It's always about everything. And that's the thing that's so hard people understand. Once you, just like you talk about the dollar, and you go, dollar's expensive, you know, well, compared to what? Dollar's cheap compared to what? Mm -hmm. At the point at which someone says stocks are expensive and we just had this 10, 15 minute conversation, you then have to go, okay, well, what about bonds? Right. Yeah. Uh, More uh, expensive. Because well, if we're going to do a standard well, deviation way of measuring it, I assure you the 10 year bond is more expensive than the S&P 500. I, yeah. I, I completely agree. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's a relative conversation. Obviously, we're multi asset class investors. Uh, when we invest client capital, it's not just about stocks or bonds or alternatives. A portfolio approach is what is required. And when you're taking a portfolio approach, you have to look at different areas of the market. And asset classes compete for capital. Where do you put? Where do you place your? Uh, where do you place your capital if you're looking at the equity market and the bond market? Well, then you have to take into account valuations. And it, uh, Dave is absolutely right. The valuations of the bond market are a lot more stretched than the valuation of the equity market. Equ- the equity market looks cheap uh, compared to the bond market. Uh, not not every and not every sector of the bond market is uh, is overvalued, but it's incredibly frothy. Uh, you know, the the uh, the ten year yield is a little over a percent. I, I I just don't understand how you can be a fixed income investor and be happy in this environment. I think it's uh, it's uh, it, it's it's I, if, I, don't, I don't know if there's ever been a worse environment for fixed income investing in history. Well, and, and do you mean by that long term, long duration uh, boring bonds, or do you mean all fixed income? I mean uh, uh, the risk free side of things. Okay. So, like a 10 year treasury or a double A rated so. corporate Very bond. So. I, I agree. I, I mean, I think if you look, um, and uh, I think I wrote about this in the DC Today a little bit, but if you look at real yield, so like a, a 10 year treasury yield at 132 as of today, minus inflation, you kind of get to a real number, it's a negative number. So to your point, is it more or less been it, negative it, 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 most of the post financial crisis? It, it, it's been negative post financial crisis, but it's in a new low now. It's it's the yeah. most negative it's been for a long time. Part and, of and, and, and the tenure, you just said the tenure, right? Yeah. The Fed funds rate's been negative real the entire no, time. No, no, no. Fed funds have been negative, but the ten year rate yeah. has popped above and below. Yeah. You know, depending on where inflation. Yeah, there's comes been in. times when you could have got uh, almost like twenty five basis points. I know points of, of real of, yield. Of real yield. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a compounding mechanism yeah. for uh, your wealth. Um, but the point is, uh, yeah, it is it is a tough time to invest in those kind of boring bonds uh, that we have. Although you know, there, it, it's tough to be devoid in a portfolio of it too. You, you do need uh, the what if scenario. What if you know the, the asset class that will save the day if if we're you know if we're off and, and things really take a turn for the worse. Um, but it's just not a lot of return to it. So you limit you limit the exposure. What what about the other sector? Uh, what about high yield, for instance? So high yield spreads today three thirty two. I mean they're they're tight. Like usually we're at five hundreds when we're talking on this thing on the podcast about where we would like to put, start putting high yield in there. But again, relative to where things you know Tina, there is no alternative. Uh, there's still something to be said about that. And what we've done in our credit sleeve, which is also fixed income, but a little lower credit quality, a little higher yielding a little bit more nuanced to the different sectors is we've selected certain areas of that high yield bond market that offer returns for our clients. And part of that is, and we can probably talk about it in structured credit, part of it's in mortgages. Um, and uh, we're able to get sort of these nice go to three, four, five percent yields with upside on it. And I actually love that part of, of what we're doing almost almost the most right now. I, I think this, I think the concept of spread is an important thing for for clients or, or laymen, you know, novice, novice investors, people who don't use the financial vocabulary that we have to, to live with, um, uh, obnoxiously so, I'm sure, because spreads are an important concept at understanding that when you say a high yield bond's at 10% or you say a high yield bond's at 5%, it's entirely possible that um, you've described the same risk and reward because at a different point in time, the spread may have been comparable. Yeah. The relative benefit or uptick in yield to the risk-free rate of a treasury or a, or a comparable maturity. And it, the fact of the matter is that uh, at any point in my career until this last year, if someone had said, forget spreads, we're just sitting here talking about a nominal yield on a high yield bond that is about equal to the 75-year history of the 10-year treasury right. of the United States government and that you can get a double B or B minus credit, it's okay, un- which is what they call a junk bond, right? right? That's yielding the same. The, the, the issue is that by only looking at nominal yield, you ignore the fact that there is a relativity over time, economic conditions and, and available um, you know, counter options that really are the relevant factor. And so therefore the spread gives you the ability to constantly measure in an apples to apples basis. I have more or less become pretty numerical about this, I think. And again, I'm not talking about structured credit right now. We're Mm -hmm. just in the high yield corporate bond space. More or less, I'll load up when they start getting north of 400 wide. Mm -hmm. The spreads become 400 basis points or higher. They haven't done that in a while. They did it COVID briefly, didn't, didn't last. And when you're sitting there in the 200s, you're just going, what in the world's going on? Um, 
the problem is, do you see yields and, and income star people? They'll, they'll take it because uh, they'll say, look, uh, it's 4% and maybe I'm going to be down 10% in value, but I need the 4%, not the 1% or 2%. You can't think that way. Yeah. You just have to think total return when it comes to high yield. I, I absolutely agree. And so, exactly. So, when you're, when we're, and I should have um, described that better. When we're talking a 330 spread over, over treasuries, treasuries at 132, so you're like at a you know, four and a half percent or so yield. Is a four and a half percent yield historically worth the risk of default in a high yield corporate bond? It wouldn't be in my book, but when you sort of compared it to the world that we live in now, it's not all that bad. And there's a huge demographic demand for this stuff. You know, there's a huge retiring population in this country that needs fixed income. They need to live off of it. You're not getting it in CDs anymore. You're not getting it in checking accounts or savings accounts. And so these things, there's just a lot of demand there. And it's, that's part of the reason spreads have collapsed. But how do you feel, Day, about the fact that those 450s, which Brian argues, and I agree with them, are relatively acceptable, that they are companies, are relatively acceptable, okay. are companies that if the Fed got out of the way, these companies should be gone. I, I, these yeah. are zombies. These, They're these companies zombie that don't companies. deserve to exist. I, I completely agree with you. I think if you, if uh, I, I forget what stat I saw the other day, for the Russell 2000 about how many of these are non-earners. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's getting uh, to a very high level. Yes, and if there wasn't this cheap capital out there, a lot of these companies would not be able to sur survive and a lot of them would go out of business. And um, it's, it's, very, it's, it's hard to live in a world where you're looking at investment opportunities and also in the back of your mind, you're saying, well, if things did become cataclysmic, then maybe everything would just get bailed out. And I, I think that starts to distort your investment thesis and it, uh, it's not a, a traditional way of analyzing uh, you know, the capital markets. I, I, I guess my point is there's been so much distortion that traditional f fundamental way of looking at capital markets, uh, to me, has, has changed slightly. Um, and because, because you have to factor in uh, you know, another actor being you know, the government that is constantly, or central banks that are constantly manipulating everything. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when, when we look at the high yield side, you can see why we have a relatively low weighting there, risk reward. They're, they're, you know, obviously, I'm a big defender of the asset class, but on that valuation basis might be a little less attractive. I talked about structured credits, a the theme of Dividend Cafe today. You mentioned that. I'll start with you, Brian, and go to Dea. But why um, – well, I don't want to – I don't want to uh, blow the – I don't want to risk us going in a place that um, – that results in me saying, "Oh yeah, I've already put all that dividend cafe, so let me get out of the way." Okay. Under my conclusion, <laughs> I, is, I haven't read it yet, but yeah, yeah no, you no one. It's, I, it's I hit, out. I yeah. hit send to to the production guys, the communications team, to get this up and running right as I walked in the studio. So I know you haven't read it. I, I vouch for that with the audience. I basically talked today about how structured credit became hyper dislocated during COVID, as it always does during times of severe distress, and that you get an illiquidity component. You get uh, that mismatch of buyers sellers, which is the illiquidity. You get um, very difficult mark to market. You you get price inefficiencies, very wide spreads, um, and they don't last long, but they are ugly. And then and and so there was this sort of opportunistic trade in structured credit. We largely participated in it in the actual moment of a bloodbath. So what would that have been? Let's call it March twenty um, third. Let's call it March twelfth through twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it kind of was. Pretty bad for a week and then real bad for a week. You know, yeah. So so um I think the buyers there are just like the most evil people on the planet. Yeah. But but I love them. Yeah. But they're like blood in the water geniuses. Okay. No one's you're not buying structured credit in that in that environment. You know the sellers are levered, you know they're desperate, and you're not looking to make anyone a friendly deal. You're looking to invoke pain upon people and, 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 and right. Okay. Yeah. So that happens for a certain period of time. Then you go a normalcy back. We came in and, and it was a very profitable trade. My conclusion was that we had a structured credit thesis that's fully played out. And now we still have a structured credit thesis and we're still long and we're still bullish. It's just a different thesis. The first thesis was distress, opportunity, dislocation, NAV discount, you know, accrual to par. The new thesis is, on a normalized risk reward basis with these asset classes trading at their pre-COVID levels, post-COVID, I think that there's still superlative yields yeah. and underlying economic fundamentals to justify it. 
Yeah. No, I totally agree. And and there is that premium in yields because there's still the risk that whatever else can happen and cause another dislocation. And you have these more complex vehicles. Structured credit is more complex than just a fixed income security. Uh, there is usually a little premium in the yield. And when you kind of go through that huge you know, sell off in 2020 into a year later, there's still opportunity there. You're still getting, say, a point or so higher in the yield because of this stuff is, uh, it was so dislocated. There's still some PTSD with it, in other words. And so um, from an economic standpoint, recovery is still underway. And so there's fundamentals that, that are um, additive to the credit backdrop of this stuff. And also you're getting a yield, little yield premium to what else there is, you know, the Tino, whatever else is out there. Um, as far as high grade corporates and things like that, so still attractive. But if the, if the if the credit fundamentals are positive, as Brian says, uh, it, does it have to mean that there's still ongoing forward movement, or is it good enough for credit fundamentals sometimes to just defend the cash flows? I, I think I think uh, the, the cash flows in, in structured credit is a bit of a different animal and requires uh, almost another degree of sophistication. Because you can have underlying collateral and the underlying cash flows can all be there, and that that all looks great. But the piece of the structure you own can be risky, so yeah. it's uh, you have you, you have to almost bifurcate your analysis of the structure and the analysis of the underlying collateral. Does it cut both ways though? It can be risky, but it can also be opportunistic. Absolutely. There can be inefficiencies that a skilled manager can exploit. Uh, I very much so. For example, yeah. if you think about the ABS market, so you know um, um, uh, you've got like auto loans, for example, or or airline uh, securitized airline loans, those types of things. When you think of the backdrop of those two different sectors and securities. The credit background is actually really was really terrible, you know, in COVID, the worst, and now it's hugely improving. And and there's opportunity there if you think about where car prices are and used car prices and all those things. The debt that's behind all that stuff gets more attractive. It sold off to zero basically. It came back, and there's still opportunity there. Same thing with the airline stuff. Yes, yes. And that, those things are inside of the structure of credit we're talking about. So so when we look at um, the credit asset class, we're a little lower on on the high yield. Uh, we like the structured credit. Um, but then outside of the credit sleeve altogether, uh, let's look at some of the other equity asset classes. Obviously, core dividend is our bread and butter. Mm. But then you go into small cap, you go into emerging markets. And there's a couple of negative things to say about both of those more growth oriented. We use them what we call growth enhancements. First of all, small cap has just performed lights out. And, and of course, most equities have. But there was quite a big movement higher recovery of small cap. Um and, and then with emerging markets, you do right now get some questions. You know, the dollar had dropped. Now it's come back. You have a kind of a currency play. Where emerging markets investors have China exposure, a lot of those things have got hit. Uh, how do you feel today about emerging markets and small cap in this context? You know, I, th I think that um, it, uh, I think that it, relatively speaking to other indices, U.S. indices look frothy. I think there's some opportunities internationally and opportunities within emerging markets. Clearly, we don't view uh, emerging markets as a, as a homogenous group. Uh, we, we take a company approach. We like the idea of buying companies that are uh, growing uh, at, at, fair, at, at fair prices or at, or at cheap valuations. And those opportunities still exist in emerging markets. And if you look, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have the data in front of me, but over the past 12 months, it's, it's one of the areas that has lagged a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. emerging markets. And I think that there's uh, opportunity going forward. So uh, I, I'm I'm bullish on the on the space, secularly speaking. I don't know about you, B. I'm looking forward to our conversations with our emerging markets partner in October, um, because they're actually we we've been in a relationship with them since right after the financial crisis. They're very bottom up, very fundamental driven, very aligned with us. We have an awful lot of client capital with them. Uh, they really were so severely underweight China for a lot of years. They've had they have a bigger China exposure now. Yeah. Um, do you feel that there is? Let, let's put it this way: We're not, but if we were direct investors in Chinese internet companies, would this be a good time to be selling? Gosh, well, yes, and, <laughs> yes and no. I, I would it be a good time to be selling now after the twenty percent sell off or twenty five percent sell off that they've had over the past couple of months? You know, I guess I would say no. But um, if we were direct investors in those equities. Um, we would be having a more, we'd probably dedicated a whole separate podcast to just yeah. that topic, because honestly, there are more risks around um, Chinese equity ownership now than probably there have been in a lot of a lot of years. And, and, and it's just because of government intervention. It's sort of a 
self-inflicted wound that they're causing for other political agendas. Um, and that makes it a tough environment to invest directly. The manager that we use, which we've used for a dozen years or so, um, obviously we, we've, we use them for these reasons. You know, they're able to do this bottom-up fundamental work for us and really analyze these companies and, and kind of help us navigate these waters. And they do have some China exposure there. Um, they're very, very large companies um, there, you know, the, the, and, um, and, but yeah, th there's definitely a risk involved with, with the space for sure. That being said, that is why, to your point, why the valuations are, are so much cheaper there because there's a baked in sort of inherent risk to the just investing emerging markets in general. Geopolitical. Geopolitical. Cur currency. Currency, the whole thing. Yeah. And I know we've talked about some of the ideas and thoughts on fixed income side on the sovereign side. And I don't know if we'll have time to get into that now or not, but there are opportunities in China <laughs> and elsewhere. Um, the equity part in emerging markets, you just need to navigate that very carefully. Uh, and then a small cap, and I'll go to Dea. Small cap, yeah, it's, it's had a great run. Um, I think that the way that we're approaching it is the right way, which is the same thing on the domestic equity on the large cap, which is just very actively managed and very bottom-up centric. And so you get companies in the portfolio that we're running that I feel great about. If you looked at buying like a whatever ETF or something index of, of what it what it exists, I think it would be quite quite expensive. Um, that said, I, I think if you put it in relative terms to interest rates, again, you'd get probably a little bit more normalization on that expensive comment. But still, um, uh, active versus passive 100% with small cap. Same thing with large cap. I completely agree. Um, I, I think I would, uh, you know how I feel about indexing. Um, Love it. I think you could get me to, I think you could get me to buy an S&P 500 fund before you could get me to buy Russell 2000. I 100% agree. Yeah. It, uh, and, and same thing with like a high yield bond index. It's like the same, it's the same idea. There are opportunities in there. There's things that we own in there that we love that are great values, but a lot of that stuff is just, is, is not appropriately priced. It's and, had and an, it's had an incredible run. It's had an incredible yeah. run. It's overvalued. But you know, you brought up the percentage of companies in Russell that are, uh, don't even uh, generate EBITDA, positive EBITDA. I think that um, it's over 30%. You, you can't get 2000 publicly traded small cap companies and say you focus on quality. <laughs> Uh, right. The, so the index is ine inevitably going to just simply be a risk on, risk off uh, benchmark. Absolutely. And and when risk is on, you'll get big returns. When risk is off, you get really bad returns. Uh, I, I I'm not doing that to my clients. I, it's I, not going to happen. I think yeah. it's a it's a it's protect yourself. It's like boxing. If you're in the small cap space, protect yourself at all times. I, I think it's a minefield out, out there. You have to be very selective. And yet, speaking of selective, I think our small and mid cap manager in the growthy space has been very selective. Uh, very low turnover, some very. really monumental returns over the years. Um, sometimes I almost want to feel like small cap is, uh, you know, daily NAV private equity. I mean, you get way less of the of the maturity of, than large cap, and yet, obviously, you're not still illiquid like private equity. But a lot of these companies are in early stages and can become kind of more impressive players. Uh, so you still like that idea, bottom up, small and mid cap? Very much so. And I think uh, what's probably added to this is the SPAC craze, yeah. where a lot of these companies were taken public. I mean, I'm amazed that there's some of the companies that are, that are publicly traded that came to market, and they, they don't even have revenue. They don't have revenue. It's just an idea. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a platform. It, it's it's absolutely incredible. I mean, we're, we're talking about no earnings. I mean, at least those companies have revenue. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's inter it's it's a... Uh, it, you have to be, yeah. So I'm going to make you. I'm going to make you a list of some dot com commercials okay. from oh, the yeah. 1990s. <laughs> there you see. go. But but you know, at the time, that's what that was also completely unheard of. Mm. Companies did not go public without profits. All right. of a sudden, they were going public without revenues, yeah. and and so then it, it kind of blew up the world to some degree. And then here you are now, and there's there's a little taste of it again, which is interesting because. The, the SPAC craze now has companies going public very early, but the unicorn phase of the last 10 years had companies delaying and delaying and delaying going public when by the time they went public, their, the, the valuations were very high. A lot of early investors had already cashed out, um, and they were very mature brands. Again, we're not saying exact specific names right now, but any name we could say, uh, people would know what we're talking about. So so it's... It, I guess I want clients to understand that these things that are happening, what happened in dot-com, what happened with all those unicorn companies in the last 10 years, what's happened with SPAC, this is, this is purely about what's in the best interest of the companies. At various moments in time in capital markets, these companies are doing what they should do, which is in what's their best interest to feed their capital needs. It has nothing to do with what's best for investors. 
And so your investors become victims to the cyclicality of some of the nonsense that happens in capital markets. I wouldn't. I don't know what could be done or should be done to stop those things. They're just different trends that happen organically throughout time. But I don't. I don't think that like someone should say, "Oh, there's a great opportunity here." Not. It, it, you just have to look to a company. Do you like this company and do you like its future projection or not? Um, but yeah, the the SPAC thing and it slowed down quite a bit. It has. Uh, yeah. I think they were getting worried about the headlines around it. They, you know, the the biggest thing that no one's talked about that really I think slowed it down was that accounting change mm-hmm. on the warrants. Saying that you were going to have to account for your warrants as debt instead of equity mm-hmm. is, uh, well, first of all, ridiculous. Yeah. And second of all, was pretty much done to kind of. Yeah, it took the punch pull away. Yeah, the, the party so. it cooled the party down a little bit. Yeah, that's it. I mean, a lot of those companies that were coming to market had already extracted all of the value out of private markets and private equity markets beforehand, and so they're coming to an IPO at a forty billion dollar valuation yeah. already. And you know, um, it's just not like yesteryear where the you know the the public markets were used to raise the capital that wasn't as needed as anymore. You know, with 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 private equity so much. Yep. So. Um, well, I guess we can't quite have all of us together talking about all the different asset classes and macro without going into this uh, spending bill and tax plans. Um, you guys have the fortune of being, I think and I hope, slightly less politically obsessed than I am. Uh, I, I, uh, prob- it's prob- probably true. It's which, probably accurate. Which yeah. I think is probably why you are both so much more balanced and well-adjusted <laughs> and happy in your personal lives than, than I am. Um <laughs> But with that said, I think we're all following this intensely as it pertains to the the expected economic impact out of policy right now. Democrats this week uh, passed by a 50 to 49 vote their budget resolution, which is necessary to at least put on the table the now discussion period for a potential bill that can go through reconciliation. They spent all night passing a lot of amendments, both Republicans and Democrats putting amendments out. Quite a few, I think it was 47 Amendments went out there. Uh, they're non-binding, but they give you a little foreshadowing of how you expect some people may vote on, around certain things. Uh, it, it's it's a t- there's a lot of complexity on this stuff because you have intra-Democrat party fights, you have uh, Republican Senate versus Republican House, and it, it, you know different chambers and different parties. It's complicated. Net net net. Tell me if you believe taxes are going higher and that will impact the market. Um, and that that's a great question. And uh, as David alluded to, I'm not as uh, in tune politically as he is. My typically my political opinions evolve around uh, developments really politically involve around asking David what he thinks and then copy pasting. <laughs> you can do worse, my friend. You can do worse. Um, but as far as as far as the tax situation, what what I the principle I cu- I generally come to is that whatever is happening politically and whatever the mood of the moment is. Uh, it's it's it. There's an ocean of difference between that and what actually gets legislated and what actually gets changed, and if you are pla- p- placing a lot of uh, confidence on your you know uh, predictive abilities based on what you think politically, I I generally that's a that's a bad way to think. And uh, I I try to go back to you know historically, you know changes in tax code despite you know who might be in power at the moment. Uh, you know, are difficult to foresee. So uh, the question is, I, I, I'm, you know, I don't really know. I, I, I'm, I'm to, big, to big Dave's point, well, uh, a few months ago, we were being told every single day by the president, by the media, yeah. by all the worry warts, they want to do a two trillion dollar infrastructure bill and raise the corporate tax rate by thirty percent. This week, a bipartisan basis, an infrastructure bill was passed. The House Democrats still have to vote for it. It's very hard to believe they're going to deny their president a victory. But it doesn't raise any taxes, and it's one fourth the size of what they had said. Yeah. So is they on to something that what people talk about the bark in politics is often not the same as the bite? I, it absolutely is true. I co- completely agree, um, and that's why I tend to be a little agnostic to it. I don't want to ignore it. Not, not neither do you. We, we pay attention to it. It's important. But as far as markets moving around in anticipation of what may or may not happen in politics, it's it's uh, it's tough to really uh, uh, to skew a portfolio one way or the other based on just that that feeling because of exactly what has turned out. So as far as where tax rates go here in this term in this administration, do I think that they could drift higher and, and go up in certain areas? I do, but I don't think it is 
what was floated out there and the fear of like a capital gain tax treatment going to ordinary income and those types of things. I think that on the margin, there'll be some tax increases. It doesn't look like in this package th that it's even in it. Um, so it's kind of business as usual for us in that regard. And frankly, even when there has been tax changes over the years, that did not mean a certain outcome in the market. It just didn't. Mm. Well, that's that's very true. And so I guess it's a question, and, and maybe we're all just speculating. We don't know, but um, I have my own thesis, but I, you know, I want everyone to have their own independent thought here. Has the market been right about this all year? Or was the market just underestimating the risk, uh, and the market would have would could end up still being surprised in the end? You know, what, what do you think? I mean, why is the market not seem to think that taxes were about to go up significantly? Well, I, I think that if and, and I, I'm you know as far as if taxes do end up increasing, uh, I I do think that would affect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there would be some volatility associated mm -hmm. with that. I think the market is expecting that not to happen. So um, mm -hmm. I, I'm of that opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the market looks at fundamentals and and those Trump other things that uh, that may yeah, or may but not after tax more. earnings are a fundamental. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think there is a small discount maybe in markets uh, because of that reason. So in other words, it's sort of baked in there a little bit. Um, so if you didn't get something changing in taxes, I actually think markets would go up a little bit, and if you did, I think they'd go down, but less so because I think some of it's baked in. So there's three people involved here, and I don't refer to Daya, David, and Brian. I refer to Mr. Market, Alexander <laughs> Hamilton, and James Madison. And Mr. Market is apparently good friends with the other two guys. Because Mr. Market has understood what so many people on all kinds of TV networks have not understood. Which is the way that Mr. Hamilton and Madison constructed our former government in this beautiful country. Is that one person cannot come impose their will. And one party cannot come impose their will. Now through time with the right majorities and right legal maneuverings. Some good legislation can get imposed or voted in. And bad legislation can get voted in. But it isn't so easy. And this is where I think Mr. Market has been closer to the founders in our separation of powers and in the unique sausage making of legislation to understand that um, we're, we're not perfectly insulated from bad legislation, but we're reasonably hedged. And reasonably hedged is pretty good when you can't get perfectly insulated. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. Totally agree. And uh, I think that part of the reason with some of these other uh, countries and, and economies and emerging areas uh, that we talk about there being more volatility in markets because it's less so that way. Yeah. Well, amen. Um, <laughs> look, guys, we got we are up against our timeline. So you got a closing thought you want to give and then Brian? Uh, I, I like your statement about, uh, you know, our founding fathers and the separation of powers. And I think they I think that was a good idea. I'm leaving, I'm leaving yeah. that. I wonder if Mr. Market was wearing the same wig as these guys were wearing. By the way. They should make, a, they should make a Broadway show really about Mr. Market with Hamilton. I bet it we would sell call tickets. It Hamilton. Yeah, it'd be good. Good idea. <laughs> Uh, closing comments. Look, I, I we talked about valuation. I, I think there's valuation and opportunities in this market, and, and part of it's overvalued, part of it isn't, and that's where we're playing. Uh, dividend stocks, uh, part of the credit market, and alternatives are probably the three asset classes that I would point out to having that uh, opportunity going forward. And let's do that in our uh, next podcast together, which we won't let many months go by. We'll do sooner than later. Let's talk alternatives. Let's do a whole podcast where we really unpack. Uh, maybe we even bring uh, Kenny in from our, our Alternatives Investment Committee to talk about why we do think that the hedge fund space and, and those more idiosyncratic opportunities are important right now in a holistic portfolio. Love I love it. it. Love it. Love it. With that said, thank you, as always, for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Check out DividendCafe.com for the this week's written commentary. And please reach out to us with any questions, comments you have. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, group discussion as much as I've enjoyed having my friends back in the room with me. And we look forward to coming back at you next week with yet another Dividend Cafe. <laughs>